Word is bond. Let's get started. All right. Uh, so today we're, we're continuing on with uh, our lectures on how to do database logging and recovery. So just as a quick update for everyone, as a refresher in terms of uh, what's due. <laughs> Sorry, that's right. Homework six is due a week from now on November 27th. Project four is due two weeks from now on Wednesday, December 6th. Uh, and then as a reminder, there's no class this Wednesday because of the Thanksgiving holiday. All right, so real quick, does anyone have any questions about Project 4? General questions. Yes? Wait, so, wait say it again, sorry? For, for 4? We'll double check that. Okay. We'll, we'll fix that. Anything else? Are you done Project 4 already? Okay. Okay, um, so as, as a reminder from where we're at is that last class we spent the time talking about uh, logging as sort of the first part of doing database recovery. And this is part of this broader picture of doing recovery in the database system. And the idea is that we want to implement some kind of method or mechanism inside of our database system that's going to ensure that any transaction that commits or any transaction that gets aborted, we end up with guaranteeing that we have consistency, uh, atomicity, and durability, despite any possible failure you can have, except for obviously if the, you know, the, the machine catches on fire and we don't have a backup. Right? We, can't, we can't protect ourselves from that. Uh, but in the normal case, that's not going to happen. And so we want to be able to handle that. And as, as I said in the last class as well, there's two parts to doing recovery algorithms in a database system. The first part is the things we're going to do at runtime that will prepare ourselves so that in the event that there is a crash, we have enough information that's going to allow us to be able to recover the database and put it back to the correct state. And then now the second part, and what we're going to talk about today, is the things that we're going to do after there's a crash to recover the database to the correct state and, again, ensure that the state of the database is, is such that all transactions are atomic, everything's consistent, and all our changes are durable. So last class we talked about right ahead logging, how to handle the first part, uh, and the second part today we're going to focus on, on the second part here. So now the method we're going to use to, to do recovery uh, is, is referred to as ARIES. Uh, ARIES is a specific class of algorithms uh, from IBM research that we're going to implement in, in our data system today, or describe how to implement in our data system today. Um, and so this was originally published in a paper in 1992 from this famous researcher at IBM called Mohan. Uh, and this is sort of the, 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 the Bible of database recovery, if you will. So this, this paper is 70 pages. It's very dense. Uh, if, if you want to fall asleep, you can try reading it. But it's actually really awesome, right? It, it basically lays out in exact detail all the things you need to do in order to do database recovery in, in your system. So although this paper came out in 1992, it's not to say that this is the, uh, prior to this, no one did recovery at all, right? This paper was really the one that sort of set in stone exactly the steps that you need to do to ensure that your database is, is fully recoverable. And so what I'll say is that what I'm going to describe to you today is a, um, a sort of a crash course, pun intended, of how to do ARIES. Um, and it's, what I'm going to say, though, is not every single database system that's, that does recovery does exactly what ARIES does. Uh, as I said, there are systems prior to ARIES that were doing recovery. There's newer systems later that do something, uh, that do recovery. And so ARIES is one specific implementation, and it's probably the, best, the most well-known. And if you took this paper and actually implemented it exactly as, you, as they describe it, you would have a database system that's fully uh, recoverable after a crash. Uh, but there's other sort of minor things you can tweak or change or drop or add will just still guarantee that you have full recovery and won't be exactly as, uh, as defined under ARIES. But again, this is considered the gold standard of how, actually how to do it, right? So the, the basic idea what's going to happen here under ARIES, there's, there's th sort of three main ideas. The first is that we're going to use write-ahead logging to record the changes that transactions are going to make while, we, while we're running on, under the normal, normal processing. And as we said in last class, 
our buffer pool manager has to use the steal no force policy to ensure that uh, this is done in the correct order. So it's a quick, quick question. What does the steal policy mean for a buffer pool manager? Right, so steel, steel policy means that, it's essentially what he said, but I'll, I'll say it more succinctly. Steel means the data system is allowed to write out to disk dirty pages that were modified by transactions that had not committed yet. And what does the no force mean? What does that policy mean? You can be very careful. So he said you can tell the, the application that your transaction committed before it actually lives on disk. Uh, if you're very close, the log, the log always has to be on disk. No force says we don't require that when a transaction commits that all its dirty pages have to be flushed out, right? So we're going to do right head logging and we're going to write out things to uh, our log in stable storage. And then on recovery, what's going to happen is we're going to uh, repeat the history during a, a redo phase where we're going to go through and reapply all the changes that were made by any transaction uh, that was running at the time when, when there, there was the crash. And this will be very clear when we see later on, like even if the, we know the transaction is going to abort, we're still going to redo its changes. Because right? we want the state of the data to be exactly the way it was at the moment we lost power. And then what will happen is on, on undo, we'll undo those changes from transactions that we know they didn't commit. But the key thing we're going to add into with Aries is that now we actually need to also record log records for any undo operation. So before last class, I just said, oh, yeah, you do all your updates and you commit. If you roll back, you just undo everything. But now we're going to actually have to Im implement uh, special log records to say, this is not an action for a regular transaction. This is an action to undo a previous action because this transaction aborted. So the combination of these three things will be enough to guarantee that we'll have the, put the database in the correct state exactly the way it was uh, if, uh, at the moment uh, that as, as it crashed without seeing any uncommitted transactions. All right, so for today's agenda, we're going to start off talking about log sequence numbers. Um, and this is important because this is going to allow us to, to, to figure out what the order of the operations in the log should be. Then we'll talk about how Aries works under normal commit and abort operations during, as we're processing transactions regularly. Then we'll extend our checkpointing protocol that we discussed last class to now introduce a new type of checkpoints called fuzzy checkpoints. Um, and we'll do this for performance reasons. And then we'll spend most of the time talking about then the recovery algorithm, the Aries part, where you actually, again, apply all these techniques from these, other, from these first three parts and allow us to put the, put the data back into the correct state. OK? All right, so the first thing is that we need to extend our uh, schema of our log record from last class to now include additional information. All right, so last class, I just sort of said, yeah, you know, transactions, when they modify the database, you just pen your log record and, you know, and then, then you write it out to disk. Uh, and in my simple examples, it was sort of obvious that the order that the actions got uh, performed on the database corresponded to the order of the operations in, in the log. Uh, but you can't actually guarantee that because otherwise you have to lock everything or take latches on everything while you, you know, update pages and update the, uh, update the log. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, maintain a counter uh, that we're going to uh, give out a, a new value from this counter every single, single time a transaction wants to create a new log record in, in, as part of a modification to the database. And this counter is going to be called the log sequence number, or the LSN. Again, so, so most simply, you can think about this as a global in-memory counter that you just do an atomic addition, add one to it, and then assign the new value to whatever, whatever thread needs that, the new LSN. And so what's going to be difficult now about the LSNs is that it's not just going to be the LSNs for the log records. I mean, sorry, we're not just going to use the LSNs to figure out what's the order for the log records. We're actually going to use these LSNs all throughout the database system in order to keep track of what's going on, what's in disk, what's in memory, uh, in all of different parts of the system. Right, so this table here shows you some examples of where the LSNs are going to be used. Right, so again, every time I need to update a page, update a record, I have to get a new LSN, and that corresponds to the order in which my log record occurred, or my modification occurred. 
and then uh, then I have to go update other things in the system to say, all right, I did this change, and here's my LSN that corresponds to the log record that where I, I made this change. So you have first the what's called the flush LSN, and this is this is going to live in memory, and this is just the last LSN that was successfully flushed out to disk, right? The last log record that was written out to disk. We know that everything from that LSN and less is now durable and safe on stable storage. Then for each page, we're going to have two, two additional LSNs. So we're going to have the page LSN, which is the newest update to the page. And then the rec LSN is the oldest update to that page. So we know the, the, uh, the LSN of when we first made the change, when it was brought into memory, right? And that's the rec LSN. And then we know the last change that was made, and most recently in history, and that's the page LSN. And again, we can use this to figure out whether it's safe to flush out a page to disk. Then for every transaction, we're also going to maintain the last LSN. That's the last action that they took. And then we have this thing called the master record, which is a LSN that's going to live on disk. And this is just going to be a pointer to uh, an LSN to, in the write-ahead log that corresponds to the last checkpoint that we took. Right? And so this last one is simply just, just for convenience so that we don't have to scan through the entire log to figure out where our checkpoint is. We know exactly where to jump. Yes? Sorry. Yes. It's just part of the page, yeah. It's in the header. Yeah. So whatever it was in memory, it gets written out the disk as well. Yes. So, and that's in addition to the normal page ID. Correct. The page ID, again, just tells you where to jump on, on disk in a file to find that page, right? And so no matter how many times you modify that page, that page ID doesn't change. In these, with these LSNs, every time you modify it, it gets, it gets, it, it always goes up. Yep. Okay. So let me get an example of how we're going to use these LSNs to figure out when it's safe to flush things out to disk, right? So as, as he just mentioned, right, every data page is going to have the page LSN, right? And this is the LSN of the most recent update that was that the transaction made to the page, um, and then we're also going to keep track of the flush LSN. And that's just a pointer to say, here's the last LSN that I successfully wrote out at the disk. And so before we're allowed to flush out a dirty page, write it out to disk, we have to check to see whether the, the flush LSN is greater than the page LSN, right? So if it is, then we know that whatever log record that corresponds to the change that modified our page as identified by the page LSN, we know that log record has been written out to disk because it's going to be less than the flush LSN, right? So the flush LSN, you, you know, you can't, uh, you can't have it jump, you know, go back in time, right? So you always have to sort of write out sequentially all the log records as, as they appear. And so if the flush LSN is some number, then you know anything less than that has been written out. So therefore, if the page LSN is less than that, you know that the log record that modified the page has been written out. So therefore, all the changes are now safe and durable in the log, so you can write out the, the page to disk. So we're going to use, again, these LSNs are essentially watermarks for us to figure out, is it safe to, to, to release the page? And then when we do recovery, we can use it to figure out uh, what was going on at the time when we crashed to figure out what, what changes we actually need to reapply or undo in our, in our system. All right, so let's look at an example like this. So we have on, on memory, we have the tail of the write-ahead log, Again, we say that it's the tail because we don't actually need to keep the full log in memory. As we flush things out, we can free up that memory and then reuse it for new log entries. All right? So we always have just the tail. And then in our buffer pool, we have uh, some, 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 one single page we brought in. So the first thing you see will be added is that in now the write-ahead log, both on disk and in memory, every log record now has a prefix of the log sequence number. And then out on... Uh, on, and a page, both on disk and in memory, we have the page LSN. Again, that's the newest LSN that, that modified the page. Then we have the rec LSN, which is the oldest LSN that, that modified the page. And then we have the flush LSN, which points to the last log sequence record or log sequence number of the last record we flushed out. And then the master record just points to the last checkpoint that we took in the log. Okay? All right, so let's look at a simple, simple scenario. So let's say that the page LSN is 13 in this case here. So it points to some log record 
uh, out there. So in this case, in this particular example, if the page LSN is 13, is this page safe to write out the disk? Yes, because the page LSN is less than or equal to the flush LSN. But let's say the page LSN points to this, this record here, right? This can't be written out because the page LSN is now greater than the flush LSN. So again, so we know whatever log record made the change to this page as identified by the page LSN, it's not safe on disk and therefore we can't write out this, this page, right? We said the reason is because if we crash and we come back, this page will be written out to disk, uh, but then we won't have, we, we possibly won't have a log record that, that says what that change was, so we have no idea to, to what the actual correct state of this, of this page should be, right? If the transaction aborted, then we need to roll back, but we don't know what the old, old value was for anything that got modified, so we don't know how to reverse that, right? So that's why, again, the, every log record has to be written out Every log record that modifies a page has to be flushed out the disk and it's safe and durable before we can write out the dirty page to disk. That's the key thing we have to guarantee throughout all of this. All right, so again, just as an overview, all log records are gonna have an LSN. It's always increasing in time, essentially just adding plus one, plus one, plus one. Um, and then every single time we, we modify a page, we have to you know, pin that page, get a log sequence number, right? Add our entry into the tail in the log in memory, then we apply our change to the, the page, set the page LSN, and then, and then we can unpin it. And at that point, the, internally the data system will know the flush LSN, it, it tracks the flush LSN and can decide when the buffer pool manager wants to flush the thing out the disk, whether the flush LSN is greater than or less than the page LSN of a particular page. And if, if the flush LSN is less than the page LSN, then that page is not a candidate for eviction. And this is something the buffer pool manager will, has to maintain. All right, so now with these LSNs, we can talk about how we're actually gonna execute transactions uh, at, at runtime. And again, there's two cases, right? There's, there's the transaction commits or the transaction aborts. So for this discussion, I'm gonna make the following three assumptions. We already said that we're gonna do steal no force with right-ahead logging, so that, that's not uh, anything, any, anything out of ordinary. Uh, but we're also gonna assume that all our disk writes are atomic. And what I mean by that is, for simplicity, we're not gonna worry about the case where a log record spans multiple pages, right? We're just gonna say that anytime we, we have to flush out a, a log record or, or a disk page, that can be, be done atomically. And obviously we know we can't guarantee that if we have large page sizes with the hardware, and so different database systems do different things to guarantee uh, uh, that, th that this happens. Like, so MySQL will actually write to a double write back buffer first, write all your pages out there, and then once that's durable, then actually then does the random writes to throughout, throughout the, the table heat. The other thing we're gonna do is that we're gonna, we're gonna assume we're running with strict two-phase locking concurrency control. Now, it's not to say that Aries is not compatible with timestamp ordering or, or other things, but for, again, for this discussion, we're just gonna assume our, our transactions are serializable, uh, and then we don't have to worry about doing cascading aborts. We, won't, we, we assume that no transaction will read any, any record or any data from, a, from another transaction that hasn't committed yet. So we don't have to worry about those kind of rollbacks. And that just sort of makes this, this, it simplifies the discussion, but it's not required to do ARIES. All right, so when and now transaction commits, we're gonna write a commit record to the log. And then once we know uh, all that, and then the next step is then flush all the log records for that transaction that come before that commit record. And then once we know that commit record has been flushed out to disk, then the transaction is considered fully committed and now we can tell the outside world that our, your transaction is finished and every, everything is durable. All right, and so obviously what's gonna happen here is we're not gonna just take every single log record, write that out you know, as a single line in some file and do an f-sync on that. Right? That would be really slow and typically the log records are smaller than a page size. So we'll batch together a bunch of, of log records together in a page and, we'll, and do a single f-sync for those. And for project number four, you guys will have to implement group commit which is essentially doing the same thing. And so this is now why you see we're gonna, we're, we're gonna have to do maintain undo information because when our transaction wants to commit, we have to flush all its log records out to disk, but interspersed with its log records will be other log records from other transactions that have not committed yet, and those will get written out to disk as well, right? 
because you don't want to have like log sequence 20 written out to disk before log sequence 10 is. So everything else has to be always written out in the, the sequential order, always increasing. You don't want gaps in the log. So when we know now our F sync is, is completed and all the changes from our transactions in the right ahead log are flushed out to disk, then we can get, tell, again, tell the outside world that our transaction has finished. But then now we're also going to write a, a new special log record called transaction end. Um, that this just is a signal to the database system that this transaction at this point in time in the log is completely finished. You will never see, you will never see it ever again. And we know that everything is, is durable in the log out on disk. And so this transaction end record does not actually need to be flushed right away. And we can write it out after we tell the outside world that your transaction has committed. Right? This is just an internal marker for ourselves to, to allow us to decide, uh, allow us to know that this transaction is truly finished. So let's look at an example here. So we have uh, transaction T4, and it wants to do a modification on object A and object B. And then in, in, our, uh, in, our, in, our, in our system at runtime, when the transaction goes to commit, at this point here, the data system says I have to flush Everything that's in my write-ahead log in, in memory that comes before transaction record 15. So now that all gets written out to disk, and then we do an f-sync there. And then we now we update the flush LSN to now say that the largest log sequence number that we know we've written out and is durable on disk is now 15. And so then we can use that to figure out you know, what other things we can write out. And then uh, later on, once we say we, we flush out all the pages or whatever happens, once we know that everything's been committed, uh, then we can write out the transaction end record. And again, at this point, we know that we don't need any more information in memory about what transaction four did. So it's safe for us to go ahead and free up this memory in, in, in for the right head log and then reuse the pages for other log entries we want to we we possibly allocate and store. Yes? Uh, we, why would the, uh, the page be, uh, still be there? Because it sounds like once you've written the transaction in, the thing is in the, in the disk anyway. So you don't need to keep that in the. Oh, you're you talking about the, the, this page? Uh, no, the, 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 the log in memory. So, so his question is all right, see, so maybe the, the diagram is confusing. The question is I get transaction end. Uh, and at that point, I know that I don't need anything else that comes before this for transaction four, so I can free up this memory. I mean, in my diagram here, I'm not showing it in terms of pages. I'm just saying here's the log, and anything that comes before it is freed up. But you're right. If we actually showed this with, a, with the, the, the breakdown of what pages we're using, the page would then be freed and then put back into a reusable buffer, you know, a reusable, you know the buffer pool, and they can reuse them for other log entries. So it's just like you, you know anything in this page has, is not needed anymore for these log records, and you just reuse it. I'm not showing that here. I'm just saying you just truncate anything that came before it. OK. okay. All right. So now for transaction aborts, uh, again, last class when I, said, when I talked about aborts, I basically said, yeah, you, know, you have some read-write set for the transaction, and you just know how to undo those changes. But now we actually, to do this correctly with Aries, we actually have to record some extra information in the log to keep track of the undo operations that we, that we did. And so the way to sort of think about this is like undoing, undo is a sort of special, uh, special case operation where it's going to be applied to a single transaction and we're going to undo its changes. But the log records, as we undo them, we're going to store new log records that are essentially update actions that reverse the changes that we made previously for our transaction. So one thing we're going to add is now an additional field in our log records called the previous LSN, or prev LSN. And this is going to be the LSN of the last log record that that transaction added to the write ahead log. And this is, on, this is done on a per transaction basis. And so we don't need this for correctness, uh, because we can always just do a sequential scan over the log and figure out What's the, next, what's the next log sequence number we need to reverse? Um, but this, we do this for performance. Because now it's really easy for us to walk back through this linked list and say, all right, I undo this action. What's the next action I need to undo? Right? And this is also really useful for cases where the log, ex the, the, 
transaction's really long and it makes a lot of changes and some of those changes in, its, in the write ahead log may be written out the disk and so I can go again just follow my LSNs, my previous LSN linked list and figure out is the LSN I need to examine in order to undo this transaction, is it actually in memory or is it on disk? And I know where to go to get it on disk. Because otherwise you have to do a sequential scan on, on the entire log record on disk to figure out uh, what are all the things you need to undo if you don't see the transaction begin, if you don't see the head of the linked list. All right, so let's go back to our example here of transaction T4. And again, you see now that we've added the, uh, the, 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 the current LSN for this operation and then the previous LSN, and in the first case for transaction begin, the previous LSN is just null, saying that this is the head of the linked list. So now uh, when we do an abort, we then we need to undo all those changes. And then once we know all those changes have been success successfully logged, then we can write out the transaction end message to say this transaction is completely done. Right? So the tricky thing though is this middle part here. What I'm not showing you is the steps we need to now do to actually undo the changes we did when the transaction was running the first time. Right? And again, the high level idea what we're going to do here is we're going to store new log records that are essentially reversing the changes that the transaction made when it ran the first time in, in, in reverse order. So it updated A and then updated B, then it aborted. So when we reverse these changes to undo it, we have to reverse them on B first and then we reverse them on A. And so these special actions we're going to now take uh, are called compensation log records. And these, again, these are basically undoing the operations of a previous update when the transaction ran the first time. And so we're going to add now an additional LSN pointer called undo next, which is just going to be a, keeping track of the next operation we need to undo when we reverse all these changes. So the previous LSN will tell us how to get back, go back in time to undo things, and then the undo next is just an additional marker to say, all right, I've, done, I've, done, I've, done, I've undone this much, and here's the next place to jump to to undo more. So these CLRs are important because if we crash during recovery, so we, we crash the first time, and we start recovering the database, and we crash again, we can use these CLRs to figure out what operations were we undoing when we crashed the second time to make sure that, again, we still put the database back in the, in the correct state. So the CLRs we added, just like any other log record, they're going to have an LSN that always has to be you know, in, in increasing order and unique. Um, but again, there's sort of a special case to say, this is what we did to undo the thing that we're trying to undo when the transaction got aborted. So let's look sort of more simple example. So here now, again, the way to think about this table is that every row is a new log record. Right, so we have our LSN, previous LSN, transaction ID, the type of operation that we're doing, uh, the object we modified, the before or after value, and then the undo next. So let's say that we get this abort, the abort operation or request for our transaction. So the first thing we need to add is, an, is a new CLR, the compensation log record, that's going to be a reversal of this previous update record that we saw before in our log. And so essentially, if you just look at what it's doing, it's taking the before value and the after value of the object and reversing them. So the first time the transaction ran, it saw value 30 in object A and set it to 40. So now we, we want to undo that. We would expect there to be object value 40, and we want to put it back to 30. Right? Again, we're undoing the, uh, the update we had before. And then we also have this un undo next, which again is just a pointer to say, if, if here's the next log record that I need to reverse in order to undo this transaction. In this case here, it's pointing to log sequence number 001, and that's just the beginning of, 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 the, of the, the chain, the beginning of the transaction. So there's no additional step that, that we need after this. So we know that we've, we've successfully undone this transaction, and therefore we can add the transaction end at this point. Yes? Yeah, so his statement is, um, do we need CLRs for performance or do we need this for correctness? Um, you definitely, you definitely, it definitely helps for performance because if you know how far you've undone something, then like, the next time you come back around, you don't need, need to undo it again. Um, for correctness, I think you need it too, but I have to think about why. 
Yes. Yeah, so, so, wait, so we'll talk about recovery in a second. So his statement is, is the issue that during recovery stuff could be written out the disk again? Yes, undo is, this, so recovery is essentially like, yeah, it's like, it's like normal execution of, of the transactions. It's just that you're not taking new transactions from the outside world. You're looking at the log and, how to, and looking how to replay things, right? Um, Yeah, statement is you need, because of the steel policy, because at any time a page could be written out the disk, you need to know, uh, you need to make sure that you log these entries to make sure that, like, if you crash, come back a second time, you know what was actually written out the disk and how to, how to put it back in the correct state. Yes, yeah, so you, you, you do need it for correctness. Uh, you, can, you can actually read it because if you're guaranteed that you basically just write an endpoint and say, I'm done recovering, then that's basically what you need, right? Because if you don't see that token, then you play back the log, from the beginning, as always, and then you can always look at the log and be like, oh, I actually have did this already. Can I say it again? Sorry. It's like, I guess, like, if, that's, if you're only doing, like, recovery of one transaction, on recovery, then I guess I can just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yes. Yes. Uh, so, you are correct. This is done for performance reason because... And it's the same reason checkpoints are done for performance reasons. Like, because otherwise you have to replay the entire log, right? And if you, you know, if your log takes you 10 minutes to recover and you, for some reason, you crash every five minutes, like, you'll never put the data back and, you know, come back online. Uh, and think about, like, the old days of, like, 1990s, 80s, really slow disks, where, like, just recover, like, reading stuff in and out of memory or reading stuff in and out of disk would be really, really slow. So this sort of helps you speed things up. Sort of like a, it's a mini checkpoint in the log to say, I know I've recovered this much. So yeah, I think this is done for performance reasons. I don't want to say exactly that it's not done for correctness, but I have to think about it. But definitely, definitely for performance. All right, so um, again, for aborting, again, we always write out the abort record to the log first. Uh, we don't need to f-sync, that's okay. Like the commit, we do have to f-sync right away. For the abort, we don't. And then we start undoing all the changes in reverse order, and we add a new CLR entry for everything we, we need to reverse, restore the old value of the object that got modified, and at the end, we write out the transaction uh, end to say the transaction is fully finished. And the reason why we don't have to f-sync this is because if we crash and come back before we write out the transaction end, the transaction abort message in the log, who cares? Because the transaction got aborted. We, it'll get aborted anyway the next time we recover. Right? It's only, only when we tell the outside world, your transaction has fully committed, we need to make sure that everything is, is durable. So we, can, we have to f-sync on the, on the commit messages. We don't have to f-sync on the abort messages. All right, so at this point in the, in the, in the lecture, we've covered log sequence numbers, so we know now how to record uh, the order in which transactions make changes to the database to a log. And that tells us how to then replay them and what order we have to replay them on recovery. And then we talked about how to do now the normal commit and abort processing in Aries, where we keep track of the, for, for commits, we just have to make sure we write out our commit messages and everything comes before, beforehand. We use the flush LSN, the page LSN, to figure out when it's safe to write out a, a dirty page out to disk. And for aborts, we add CLRs to undo the changes that we, we just made at runtime for, for an aborted transaction. All right, so now we need to talk about how to do fuzzy checkpoints, which, again, the idea here is for, for performance. We don't want to have to replay the entire log. This allows us to have a, to sort of cut off how, how far back in the log we have to look. And then we'll get to the recovery algorithm, how we put this all together and actually do recovery to restore the database to the correct state. So in last class, I talked about how to do a really naive or simplistic checkpoint scheme where you essentially halt the entire database system while you take a checkpoint to, to ensure you have a cons consistent snapshot. So what you have to do is you basically tell the, the system to stop accepting any new transactions, so no new transactions can start, and then any transactions that are currently active, you have to wait until they finish, then when they're done and committed or, or aborted and you roll back their changes, then you go ahead and can take a checkpoint. Right? And this ensures that you have a consistent state of the database when you write it out. 
And one thing I should be clear about is when I say checkpoints, I don't mean like a delta checkpoint you would see in some file systems where you have sort of making multiple copies of the database. Right? This really is taking all of the dirty pages that are in memory and then flushing them out, flushing them out to disk. So if you come back, the, the database is in the exact state it should be. So in this, for this particular uh, scheme, it's obviously bad because we have to stop the world while we take our checkpoint. Right? We can't accept any new transactions, and we have to wait for any active transactions to finish before we can go and, and go ahead and take the checkpoint. And if, you're, so if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if your transactions are short and the amount of memory you have is actually small, then maybe this is not a big deal. But if you have a one terabyte uh, buffer pool size, then you have to basically stop all transactions from running while you flush out that, that one terabyte of memory out the disk. And then furthermore, if you have transactions that can take hours and hours and hours, and you, and you want to take a checkpoint, and one of those multi-hour transactions just start, you have to wait till that thing finishes before you can then go ahead and take the checkpoint. And all the while, you're stopping the world, and you're not, you're not accepting any new transactions. So basically, your data system looks, um, looks down or broken or, or you know, off for this long, long period. So this is obviously bad. So a better way to do checkpoints, which is not the way we actually want to do it, but it's better than what I proposed before, is that we're going to pause the transactions while we take the checkpoint, but we're not going to require the database system to, to wait until all the actual transactions actually finish. Right? So the way to think about this, say you have, you're in memory, you have a bunch of pages, and then you want to write out your checkpoint to disk. So I'm going to have one thread be the checkpoint thread, and this is essentially just going to do a sequential scan on every single dirty page in, in memory and write them out sequentially in, on the disk. And then I have some other transaction that wants to scan maybe in the reverse order and update some, some pages. So let's say that at the beginning, the transaction modifies page three, uh, and then the checkpoint starts. So the transaction gets stalled, it modified page three, and the checkpoint scans through and it writes out the changes, uh, it writes out page one and two, and gets the modifications from transa the transaction in page three. Then when our checkpoint completes, then the transaction is allowed to keep on running, and then it can go and, and modify page one. But because we, st we stalled that transaction at the moment when the checkpoint started, even though this transaction modified page three and page one, our checkpoint will only have the changes from page three, because that modification occurred before we took our checkpoint. Right, so this is an inconsistent state of the database because now on disk we're going to have changes from uh, the, the transaction in page three, but not as changes in page one. So we're going to have to maintain some extra information to keep track of what was the state of the database at the moment we, we began our checkpoint. And so the two additional things we need to keep track of is the what's called the active transaction table or the ATT, and this is the this is basically the set of transactions that were running at the moment I took my checkpoint. And then the dirty page table is just the set of the pages that I know that were dirty in memory. And dirty means that they were modified by a transaction that has not committed yet um, in memory when I started the checkpoint. So in the ATT, again, we're going to store an entry for every single transaction that was active at the time we started our checkpoint. And we're just going to have to store this transaction ID, the status of, of its current mode at the moment the checkpoint started. And this could be either because it's active or it's committing, right? It's, it's flushing out its log records, uh, or it's a possible candidate for undo, meaning we don't know whether this transaction was going to commit or not, because at the moment we took our checkpoint, it had just started running, but it actually modified the database, and we don't know whether later on it's going to commit. The, the commit could occur after our checkpoint started, but at the moment we took our checkpoint, we don't know what happened. And then we're also going to maintain the last LSN, and again, this would be the last LSN that was written by the transaction that made it out to disk. So now when a transaction commits or aborts in our ATT, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and throw that away. And the DPT, the dirty page table, we're going to keep track of all the pages that are in our buffer pool that contain change, changes from uncommitted transactions. Right? So this would be any transaction that's in the ATT that's set to be uh, uncommitted or a candidate for, 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 candidate for undo. And so the only thing we need to maintain in the dirty page table is just the rec LSN, and this is just the LSN of the log record that first caused the page to be dirty. So what's, what's the LSN of the last transaction's log record uh, that modified, or sorry, what's the LSN of the first transaction that modified this page when we brought in the memory that caused it to be dirty? 
So now what's going to happen is when we take a checkpoint, we're going to record the ATT and the DPT in the checkpoint information, as well as all the disk pages that we write out. And again, for this scheme here, we're, we're pausing all the transactions. We're not allowing them to keep on running while we take the checkpoint, but uh, we don't have to wait until they actually finish. Right, so transactions are still in flight while we took our checkpoint. So we need to record this information to say what transactions are around, what did they, and what do they modify. So in this case here, when we take the first checkpoint, T2 is still running, right? So our active transaction table will just contain T2. T1 committed before our checkpoint, so we don't need to record anything there. And then in the dirty page table, we say that there's page 10 and page 12. They were modified by some other transaction. Uh, like in this case here, it has to be uh, T2. And so it, it was modified by these, these transactions, and therefore it, it, we have to record that, that we know about them. When, uh, when we took our checkpoint. Then now in the second checkpoint, at this point here, transaction T2 committed in between the first checkpoint and the second checkpoint, and transaction T3 started. So T3 is the only thing we're going to have in our active transaction table. And then in our dirty page table, <coughs> excuse me, we have uh, page 10, and then we have page 33. So page 10 is still hanging around, was modified since the last time. And page 33 was modified by transaction T3. So in this case here, these pages have not, have not been flushed out. So in this case here, this is better than with the checkpoint we had before, because again, we can allow transactions to, we just pause them. We don't have to wait till they actually finish. Um, but this is still not great, because again, we're still stalling all our transactions while we take our checkpoint, which can occur for, you know, the checkpoint could take hours if we have a really large, large memory buffer pool and we have a lot of dirty pages and slow disks. So we need a better way that allows us to take a checkpoint, still allow transactions to run while we're taking the checkpoint, and then still be able to, to reconcile the fact that there's some pages that got modified after we took the checkpoint and we may, we, we may, we may, may not know about them. Yes? So the dirty pages, are all the pages definitely dirty? His question is, is anything in the dirty page table, are they definitely dirty? What do you mean, and by definitely dirty, you mean that? They definitely are like ahead of what's on disk. Correct, yes, they're ahead of what's on disk, yes. But could it, like, like, say, like, T2 also modify, like, say, P10 after T3 did, and then T2 commits before T3 finishes, then P10 will, like, the stuff that T3 did to P10 and we'll also be on this now. So it's not technically not a dirty page. It's like a... Wait, sorry, sorry, sorry. What, what are you saying, sorry? Uh, if you write out a page, you would unpin it. Yes? And then if you unpin it, I don't think it's treated as a dirty page anymore. So a... His, his, sorry. <laughs> One last time. Okay, so his statement was, if P10 was modified by both T2 and T3, T2 commits, therefore, any change that it, um, any, any log record that contains the entries, any log record that modified that page would have to be written out the disk, and therefore, the T2 is allowed to commit, but then we flush out P10, and P10 contains changes from T3, and T3 hasn't committed yet, is that still considered dirty? In that case, uh, no. Yeah, so I, what I should have done made this more clear is I should have said exactly what pages these guys are modifying, and that, that would have made this more clear. Yeah. OK, so as I said, this, I, and, and what was your point, sorry? Correct, yes, 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 okay. Okay, so the way we're going to solve this is through fuzzy checkpoints. And again, this is another, uh, this is another contribution of what ARIES provides. So a fuzzy checkpoint is where the data system is going to allow other transactions to keep on running while we're taking the checkpoint and not, not have to stall them. So now to do this, 
we need to now record not just that we took a checkpoint, we actually need to record the boundaries of when we started our checkpoint and when the checkpoint finished. And then when we, when we finish, we'll record what the actor transaction table and the, the dirty page table was at the moment that we, that we finished. All right, so let's look at an example here. So the first thing to point out is when, when, we, when we record a transaction begin, uh, that's what we're going to update the master record on disk to say, again, after a crash, you need to come back and figure out what should be the state of the database uh, on the pages on the disk. You would find the checkpoint begin and then look at for the checkpoint end, and then I'll help you figure out what, how, what exactly was going on at the time of the crash. So now, any transaction that starts after the checkpoint begins will be excluded from the, from the, the, the AT team in the begin record, sorry, the, the end record for the checkpoint. So in this case here, transaction T2 started before our transaction began, so therefore it's in our ATT. And then for the dirty page table here, these are the pages that were modified um, at the moment our checkpoint began, and so all those are written out. So the way to think, to think about this is the, the, it's, it's recording all of the, uh, it's all the pages that, that are possibly dirty in memory and therefore, we should make sure that we, we apply those changes again when we redo transactions on recovery. Right, so again, this is just a boundary to say our transaction began, tra and tra transa or sorry, our transac check checkpoint began, our checkpoint ended, and here's what was going on while we wrote all these pages. And here's the pages that could have been modified by transactions uh, during, during this point. All right, so now, for recovery. So we have our fuzzy checkpoints. We have our write alert log that has all the, the, the LSNs, previous LSNs, the CLRs. So now we got to say, all right, we crash, come back. We have our disk pages. We have a write ahead log. How do we figure out what, what to recreate the world to put us back into the correct state? So the recovery phase, the recovery is going to be broken down into three phases. So in the analysis phase, you're just going to read through the write ahead log and try to identify all the early pages that were in the buffer pool and we're all transactions that were active at the time when we took our checkpoint and then at the moment that, that, that we crashed. Then we're going to go back and repeat all the actions starting from some point in the log and reapply all those changes to, to the database. Right? And we don't, we're going to assume that we don't know whether the, uh, the dirty pages, the pages that were modified, the pages that the transactions modified made it actually to disk or not, so we're always going to replay them. And then, and it's also, too, when we redo things, we're also going to replay all the changes from transactions that will end up later ab aborting, right? Even though we may know that they abort because we can see through the analysis, we're always going to redo them. Then in the undo phase, we're actually then undo those, those, those operations to reverse any transactions that we know that did not actually commit. And we know they're not going to commit because we're not going to see either an abort message or we don't see any uh, commit message at the end. Sorry, we do see an abort or we don't see a commit then we know the transaction didn't fully finish. We never told the outside world that they finished, so we go ahead and, and can reverse those changes. Okay, so visually, it sort of looks like this. Right? So we crash, come back, we look at our master record, that's out on disk, and that's going to tell us the, uh, the last checkpoint that we took. So we're going to start our analysis phase at that moment there. I'm going to scan uh, from the checkpoint time to the end of the log, right, going forward in time. And then, based on this analysis, we'll figure out, well, what's the smallest page that was dirty? Uh, find find the, the, the last LSN of a transaction that modified a page that was active at the time we took our checkpoint. And that'll tell us how far back in the log we need to go and reapply all those changes. Right? Because we know that this is the... Um, we know there could not be any change in the log that came before this moment that was not applied to a page and actually written out the disk. So we know any page that's modified prior to the rec LSN that I'm pointing out in the redo phase, anything prior to that is now durable in the disk pages. We don't need to worry about them. Then in the, in the third phase, the undo phase, we need to start from the, the end of the log, so at the, the newest amount of time, and then now go back in reverse order and undo all the changes from uncommitted transactions. 
And then and what I'm showing here is that the undo may go beyond the redo phase because there may be a transaction that modified the database. Its changes got made in the pages, made it out to disk, but the transaction never actually committed. So we need to go farther back in time to, to undo all of them. And this is why I'm saying we're going to assume strict two-phase locking because we're not going to worry about any transaction reading changes from an uncommitted, uncommitted transaction. All right, so I'll go, I'll go through each of these phases one by one. So again, in the analysis phase, the high-level idea is that we want to reestablish knowledge of what was going on in our database at the, at the moment they took a checkpoint, and then we can scan forward in time and, and figure out what all transactions we're end up having to abort or commit. So we start off by looking at the checkpoint, you look at the ATT and the DPT, and then now you can scan forward from that last checkpoint. And any single time you see a transaction make a modification, then you want to add its entry to the active transaction table. If you see a transaction end, then you go ahead and remove it because you know there's not going to be anything else that comes after that transaction end record for that particular transaction. It's been fully, you know, fully removed, fully committed. And then for all other log records you find, uh, you'll add the transaction to the ATT with the undo state because at that point during the scan of the, of the log, you don't know whether it's actually going to commit yet because you're going forward in time. And then when you see the commit record, then you go ahead and update the ATT status to be commit for that transaction. So that says that we need to make sure that all the changes for this transaction are, are reapplied during the redo phase and we don't want to undo them. So this is sort of a good example, though, of a possible race condition that you can have in a database system where the database system thinks your transaction committed. It, did, it wrote the commit message to the log. And it was about to send the response back to you and say your transaction committed, but then, then it lost power and you never got back that response. So you think the transaction actually got aborted, but internally the data system actually says, oh, it actually committed and actually will reapply those changes. Yes? So his question is, on a commit, do you have to update the DPT? From the DPT? No. Right, because that's done by the buffer pool manager as it flushes things out. The ATT is like, here's all my transactions that, that are active, and they could have dirty pages that, you know, after I've commit, they may not actually get flushed out to later on. Yeah. All right, and then for any update entry, so any log record we see that is actually modifying the database, uh, if the page is not in the DPT, then we'll go ahead and add it. And then we set its rec LSN, so the LSN of the last, the oldest LSN of the transaction that last modified that page to be the current LSN of this update record. All right, so again, we're essentially just building up state about what was going on in our system in, during the analysis phase. So then when we scan through again, we can then figure out what, what changes should get aborted, what changes should get uh, committed. Yes? The question is, does the buffer manager update the DPT? Um, that's like an implementation detail. Like, it doesn't have to, but like, some, so some systems have like a recovery mode where they have sort of special components that actually um, maintain all the state information and, and track things. And then at runtime, you don't actually need to do this. Uh, other systems are essentially always kind of always in recovery mode. So they're always maintaining this information automatically. So in that case, it would be the buffer pool manager. Weird, the dirty page table seems like information that only the buffer pool manager truly knows whether it's dirty or not. But we're maintaining this information at like not the buffer pool level, but at this like Aries level. So like, isn't there a chance for them to like be consistent? So his question is, um, this seems weird because the dirty page table should be something that the, the, the buffer pool manager maintains. But now there's this Aries component, the, the recovery manager, that has to maintain this information as well. And could they end up being inconsistent? Again, typically what happens is you switch the database system onto a, a special recovery mode. You don't accept any new transactions. So the recovery manager is essentially just piggybacking off the dirty page table that the, that the, the buffer pool manager will already maintain for it. OK. Yes. 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 Yes.
case, it's going to, okay, it could be that I commit it. So I'll acidate this when it comes back. All right, so his question is, uh, the race condition I just said where we flush out the commit message, but before we send the acknowledgement to the application that our transaction actually committed, we crash. Uh, so then the application will, will time out because the connection gets dropped eventually. Why is that a problem? Yeah, it's so, so I say, it's not a problem for the database system. We don't care, right? Because we, we committed it. We did it. We did what you want. But we lost power. <laughs> we couldn't, couldn't prevent that. Um, it's more the onus is on the application programmer to then be able to say, oh, I timed out. I need to go back and when the data system comes back online, figure out whether my thing actually committed or not, right? So it's not a problem for the database system implementation. We did the correct thing. We got, we got your transaction. It's committed. It's, you know, we, we, everything's durable. But we just couldn't send you the acknowledgment in time. We don't care. It's the application has to write extra code to say, all right, did that commit actually succeed or not? Right? And most applications probably do that. Or sorry, most applications do not do that. <laughs> OK. All right, so now, in, so again, the analysis phase, the way to think about this is the ATT is going to tell us what transactions were active at the time of the crash. And then the DPT will tell us what are the dirty pages that may have, may have not made it to disk. Right, and this is, this is again, you, you jump to some point, whether you took the last checkpoint, you scan through, bit out this information, and then this tells you what, what was going on. So let's look at a simple example. So we have, start off, our transaction does begin, uh, begins the checkpoint, I'm sorry, our data system begins the checkpoint, and at this point, then we, we, we're taking the checkpoint, and then we, uh, we transaction 96 makes a modification. So we're going to add entry into the actual tra transaction table to say, here's transaction 96. We, it started before we began our checkpoint, so we add its first entry into the ATT, and then the they have the transaction ID and then its status. And then U means it's, it's an undo candidate. We don't know at this point in time during our analysis whether this transaction will commit or not. So we have to say, if, as far as we know at this point in time, it's, gonna, it's not going to commit, so we're, we're going to have to undo it. Then now, uh, sorry, and then also too here, I'm showing that we're, we've modified page 33 in our transaction. So now in our dirty page table, we have that page 33 is dirty. Then we get to our checkpoint here. And now we write out that uh, we have in our ATT that the, there's transaction 96 that we already knew about because we saw the update in, in LSN 20. But then there's also transaction 97 that started and made modifications before we began our checkpoint. So that ends up getting put in our ATT from the checkpoint end message. So we can add that to the ATT that we're building during the analysis phase. And then we also see that somebody modified page 20 as well. So that's dirty and that ends up in our DP, DPT. Then we get to 40, transaction uh, 96 commits. So now we update our ATT to say the transaction 96 status is commit, because we saw the commit record. And then 97 still remains uh, uncommitted or undo candidate. And then when we have our transaction end, we can then finally completely remove transaction 96 from the ATT, but then we still have our, our dirty pages hanging out. Right? So again, this is, this, this is the ATT is where we're going to build this up as we scan along and during the analysis phase. And then the ATT and DPT that are in the checkpoints is providing us extra information about what was occurring in our system before we started our checkpoint so that we don't have to scan all the way up back in time beyond the checkpoint to figure out what, what else was still running. So we're going to build the ATT and the DPT for, on, our, on our analysis phase. And we supplement with, it, with the additional information that's in the checkpoint end message to say, here's other transactions that were still active that you may not know about because you haven't seen any log records. All right, so now that we've done our analysis, now the next step is to do redo. And what we're going to do here is that we're going to repeat the history to reconstruct the, date, the database back to the correct state it was at the moment of the crash. And this includes any transactions that, that will end up getting aborted because we want to look exactly the way it did at, at the moment of the crash. All right? And so what's going to happen is if we're going to reply all our updates, and then add CLRs for anything that, we're, that we possibly need, need to undo. <coughs> and so there are some optimizations you obviously can do to avoid unnecessary reads and writes. Uh, like if you know a transaction is going to ab abort because you saw it in the analysis phase, then maybe you don't need, and no other transaction modified the same pages. So therefore, you don't need to actually redo anything. 
just or, during the redo phase, you just say, oh, this transaction doesn't commit, so I'm not going to actually apply those changes. I'm going to ignore all those obvious optimizations right now. I just want to go through the sort of the, 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 the naive implementation, and that way you understand exactly how it works. And then obviously you could go back and do some additional things to speed things up. And this is where most systems deviate from the, from the ARIES standard because there's a bunch of things you can do to, to avoid uh, un unnecessary writes. All right, so again, we're going to scan forward from the log record that contains the smallest rec LSN in the DPT. Again, this is the transaction that, the last transaction, the oldest transaction that modified the page with the lowest LSN for any page that exists in our dirty page table. And then for every log record we're going to, uh, to, to reapply, we're going to redo the, or including any CLR, uh, we're going to redo the action unless the following uh, criteria are met. So the first is that if the affected page is not in the DPT, then we know the modification made by that log record has been written out to disk, so we don't have to redo it. Uh, if the affected page is in the DPT, but its LSN is greater, our record's LSN is greater than the smallest rec LSN for that page, uh, then we know we, we can skip that. Or if the, if the affected page LSN is greater than this LSN or this log record, then we know that that page got flushed out to disk after we made this log entry uh, in time, so therefore what's on disk is actually the, the newer version that we don't need to update for this particular transaction's change. So then to reapply it, we just reapply the log action, set the page LSN to our, to our log records LSN, and then we don't need, for, for reapplying action, we don't actually need to add an additional uh, CLR or do any flushing or forcing, right? We just let things happen uh, we let things get flushed out as needed, and because we can always go back and reapply those changes later on. And then at the end of the redo phase, for any transaction that's sit, sitting around in the ATT where we saw a have a commit status, but we didn't actually see the transaction end, we can add a new transaction end record to to the log. Again, this is just telling us that we've applied all our changes for this transaction to to the log and on disk, and therefore we don't need to worry about them in the ATT anymore. So then in the last phase, the undo phase, what we're going to do is just undo any transactions that were active at the time it was a crash, uh, but didn't actually commit. And we know which ones these are because we, or we built that ATT during the analysis phase. So at the end of the analysis phase, if there's any transaction in the ATT with the undo candidate status, then we know they didn't commit and we need to go back and reverse all those changes. So essentially what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to go and reverse LSN order. So start from, from the, the, the greatest LSN and go back in time and undo all their, all their changes um, uh, that for, for these uncommitted transactions. And then it's just like a normal operation at runtime when we had an aborted transaction where we had to apply create CLR records. For any time we need to undo a, an operation from an aborted transaction, we have to add new CLRs for those as well. Right, so it's sort of like the Runtime operation for aborting a transaction is the same as the recovery operation to abort a transaction. You always have the CLRs to say how to, what, what was the reversal you actually did. All right, so I realize this is very dense. Uh, Aries is always sort of difficult to follow, but hopefully some visual examples will make this more clear. All right, so here we have a sort of a log, and a sort of way to think about this is that uh, what I'm not showing here is that every log record is going to have a previous LSN that's going to allow us to say for a particular transaction, if we need to reverse it, how to jump through the log and find all those entries to quickly uh, re uh, remove things. Right? So let's say in our example here, after we, uh, at this point in the log, we end up with a crash. So now when we do our analysis, we're going to build out our ATT and our DPT. And it's going to look like this. And so for, to save space, I've sort of uh, put multiple log entries on a single line. So checkpoint begin, checkpoint end. Right. The way to think about this is this is zero zero for zero five for n. I'm just putting them together on, on a single line to save space. All right. So the first thing we see that in our ATT, we need, we have these transactions T two and T three. They did not commit, so we know we're going to have to undo them, right? And so their status is, gonna be, is in the ATT will be undo candidates. And so we know the last LSN for the, both these transactions that correspond to the last modification that got written out to the log. So 
we're going to go ahead and start undoing these things. So in the first case here, we're going to undo the modification that transaction T2 did at LSN 60. And then we're also going to put around now a pointer to say the next log record I need to undo will be 20 up here. Right, this is just, again, think of this as like the previous LSN, keeping track of how to jump back in time to f quickly find the thing you need to, the next reverse. You don't need to have this, again, this is done for performance reasons, because you don't want to scan the entire log to figure out what's the next thing I need, need to undo. Right, you can jump exactly to the page that has the thing that you want. But now let's say we get, we get to here, and then we start undoing uh, transaction T3. The same thing, we, we reverse the change at log sequence number 50. Then we get transaction N to say this thing's actually done. But before we can actually undo the next operation for transaction T2, uh, we crash. So at this point here, when we have transaction T3 TXN, we can flush the right head log to disk, and now we know all its changes are, those are durable. But now we crash again during our recovery. So when we come back, uh, we're going to lose everything we have in our ATT that we had before, but we're going to redo the analysis phase again. And now in our ATT, we only need to have T2 in it because we saw that T3 finished, reversed all its changes. We saw the transaction end message. So we don't need to undo anything for T3. Everything now is, is, is durable. So now what we're going to do is jump ahead just to, to LSN 70. And in this case here, uh, we need to follow the chain back to say what we need to undo. And because we already undo this first one, we don't need to undo, sorry, undo this at LSN 70, we undo the change at LSN 60. We don't need to redo that, so we just need to undo the one at T20. So we just have that one entry. Then at this point, we flush out the log and our transaction is fully done. So the way to sort of think about this is, when I came back the second time, I looked in the log and I saw that I have a CLR for transaction T2 that reversed the change for 60. And I know things got flushed out uh, because I flushed things out at when this guy committed. So I know when I recover the second time, I don't need to undo this one at 60 because that was already undone at 70. I need to undo the one at 20. So that's why I only have a single CLR for the operation that occurred at LSN 20. Then I know that's the end of, my, of all the changes from this uncommitted transaction. I can write out the transaction end message and now the database is in the, the exact state it should have been at the moment of the crash without any uncommitted transactions. And now at this point, I'm ready to start accepting new transactions and updating the database. Everyone's eyes are bleeding. Everyone's falling asleep. Don't feel bad. This is, uh, Aries is, is very painful to get through. Um, and again, this is another great example of why you always want to use a database management system, right? You don't want to build something yourself unless you, again, this is what you, you know, if you're like us and build database systems, you don't want to make your own data system for some, you know, JavaScript application or whatever you're building because doing all of this is super hard and it's really hard to get correct, right? And the, I'm trying to cover it in an hour and a half and there's way other more corner cases you have to deal with that we're not even talking about here. And it's really, really hard to do. And this is why, you know, database systems that are, you know, vetted and well-written and been around for a long time are guaranteed to be more safe than anything you can whip up on your own with, you know, in, in, in a day, right? Aries is hard. Implementing is hard. You don't want to have to do it unless you're building a database system, okay? Okay, so what happens if it crashes during analysis phase? What's this sort of obvious answer, right? If we crash during analysis phase, what do we do when we come back online? What's that? Or redo what? Analysis, right? You, yeah, you have, at analysis phase, you haven't done anything. So who cares, right? But let's say you crash during the redo phase. What happens? What's that? Yes? Once you re-redo, you'll redo everything again. Yeah, you have to redo everything again, yes. Yes. All right. Uh, we talked about this before. How do you limit the amount of work you have to do in the redo phase? Uh, so again, because we're in this recovery mode, we're not accepting new transactions from the outside world. So we don't have to worry about right away that we have to flush everything immediately. We can flush in the background uh, and continue to keep processing things. And uh, again, long as we make sure that any entry to an updated page gets written to the log first before we, the flush dirty page gets written, then 
everything will, will still be durable and correct. In the case of how do you limit the amount of work you have to do in the undo phase, for this one, the only thing you can really do is in your application code is just avoid having long running transactions. Right? If you have a transaction that takes five hours to run, then you're going to have to go back and undo five hours worth of work during the undo phase. There's nothing the data system can do to sort of speed that up. Right? OK. So to finish up, uh, the main ideas we, just, we talk about with Aries are we're going to use right ahead logging with additional LSNs to keep track of the order of things, uh, both going in sequential order and in back in reverse order for particular transactions with the previous LSN. And we're going to use scan steal no force to make sure that we write out pages to the we're, we're, dirty pages in the buffer pool can only be written out to disk once the, the log records that modified them are written out. We'll use fuzzy checkpoints to keep track of uh, what was going on, what active transactions were running, and what was dirty in our buffer pool manager at the moment that we, that we took the checkpoint. And during recovery, we're going to redo everything since the earliest dirty page, and then undo anything that did not commit by the end, end of the log. And then we'll use CLRs when both undoing and uh, both at runtime and recovery. This allows us to have, uh, be able to support recovery multiple times after, uh, if we fail during restarts. And again, these LSNs are really important because, again, this is, allows us to figure out exactly the order that we should replay all these operations. Now, we'll see, and if you take the advanced class, you'll see that these LSNs become a big bottleneck because if you have a bunch of multiple cores modifying the, the database at the same time, uh, having everyone try to get the same uh, atomic number will become a bottleneck because you need to synchronize that across all your cores or sockets. And so there's a bunch of schemes that allow you to have LSNs and batches so that the different sockets don't need to coordinate with each other every single time you need, you, you need a new LSN. All right, so any questions about, about recovery? Yes? Yeah, how does that work with multi-versioning? So the question is, how does Ares work with multi-versioning? Uh, it works exactly the same. Yeah, but uh, it seems like there are a bunch of optimizations you can have if you have multi versioning because, for example, once you come back, there is no active transaction running. So I can just point to whatever version is correct and prove all the others. Right. So his statement is that with multi versioning, there's a bunch of optimizations you can do because you know that, first of all, depending, you always have the old version sticking around. So maybe you don't need to actually reapply the change that you need, right? There are a ton of optimizations you can do with MVCC that I'm not covering here. We're doing simple in-place updates with strict two-phase locking. Like that, and if you understand that, then you understand then how to apply that then to a multi-version environment. Uh, yeah, so this like concept recovery mode, it seems like so then the idea is the system just like locks everything until it's fully finished, um, like doing Aries. Oh, so, 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 so if, you, if you had a system that was running in, in constant recovery mode? No, the concept of recovery mode. Oh. Yeah, yeah, so. Are there systems that, like, if you have a system that, like, perform areas in the background and still, like, but then, like, allow for immediately start using areas? So, his. So, his question is I said on a recovery mode, essentially, the data system has to block all transa new transactions from running until you know the database is back in the correct state, then you can start accepting new connections. And this question is, are there any database systems that can have sort of a lazy recovery scheme where you, the system boots up, and then you, in the background, you, you start recovering the database, but in the meanwhile, you still can send apply changes or take new transactions. Um, I know there's papers on this. Uh, so the Gertz Graffi, the guy that does Volcano, he has something called instant recovery where essentially you allow transactions to run and read and write data as long as they don't, um, after you do the analysis phase, they can read and write data as long as they don't modify anything that you know you still need to redo or undo, right? I don't know whether anybody actually does that in practice. And then in our own system, we have a technique called right behind logging where it's sort of the same thing. We know what pages have been recovered, and as long as you don't read and write to them, you can read and write anything else. Um, as far as I know, I mean, MySQL and Postgres don't do this. You'll see this, if you, if you pull the plug on MySQL and boot it back up, look in the log, you'll see, the, you'll see like the, not the right-hand log, but like the debug log. It'll say restoring the database from the checkpoint and log, right? Everybody pretty much does it this way. Okay. So at this point in the semester, uh, 
I've taught you everything you need to know, whether you remember it or not, but I've taught you everything you need to know now to build a single node asset database system. So you can quit CMU and go do a startup or go work on Oracle, right? Here's, everything you, we've talked about so far is what you need to do to have a system that say you can support transactions that are ACID and you know, then be able to process queries and, and run things correctly. So now we're gonna switch over and now talk about how to do this in a distributed environment. The basic ideas are still gonna be the same, right? We still need concurrency control, we still need recovery, we still need you know, areas like things. But now in a distributed environment, things are a lot more tricky because now you have do coordination across multiple machines. Some of the algorithms will be the same, but just the delay in sending messages can be uh, much longer. And in some cases, the, the messages can, can disappear. And so you need to do additional things to account for that. So at this point in the semester, when we, when we come back after the holiday break, we'll now start to talk about how you build a distributed database system. So we'll first talk about how to do distributed transaction processing, and then we'll talk about how to do distributed OLAP or analytical processing. Okay? Any questions? All right, guys. Uh, see you uh, next week. Have a good holiday.